up in Denver, the Denver chapter, when it started, many of our Roman soldiers for Passion Play were CMA, all the guys. They liked riding their bikes with their costumes on at times. It was fun. You guys can stand with us, this, with us this morning. Let's sing a few together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Garments spotless are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are you garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom comes, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul? Bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white and snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? The last verse goes like this. Inside the garments that stain with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your God? But this are as no are you washed in the blood. Just sing it one more time. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments but this are as no are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? we haven't sung for a while, but I love the words. We learned this at a camp down in Oklahoma. It's been a few years. It's called You Are the Holy One. It goes like this. Ah, uh, there we go. I will live to declare your glory, and my heart is filled with praise. I will shout and I will sing for all of my days. Want to walk in your holiness, Lord. Want to stand for all your ways. When you call, I will say yes, Lord, all of my days. Gonna die so you can live. Resurrect my heart again. I will tell the world that you are the Lord. To declare your glory and my heart is filled with praise. I will shout and I will sing for all of my days. Wanna walk in your holiness, Lord. Wanna stand for all your ways. 
When you call and we'll say yes, Lord, all of my day. Gonna die so you can live. Resurrect my heart again. I will tell the world that you are the holy one. You are the holy one. And the worship your name. sounds so good. I want to sing one more time from the top. What do you think? I will live to declare your glory and my heart is filled with praise. I will shout and I will sing for all of my days. Want to walk in your holiness, Lord. Want to stand for all your ways. When you call, I will say, yes, Lord, all of my days. Gonna die so you can live. Resurrect my heart again. I will tell the world that you are the holy one. You are the holy one. And the words in your name. can have a seat if you'd like. Keep singing with us, though. I remember going to that camp. We were, we were on our way to Oklahoma, not out of the state of New Mexico yet. And the old church fan, it just decided it was going to call it good right where we were. I think Tucumcari, somewhere in there. <laughs> That's about where we were. And Ralphie was with us going on that trip. And he was really not feeling good about us breaking down out there. I said, Ralph, it'll be okay. We're gonna, the church will send some help. We'll get some new vehicles. We ended up going to camp that year in new uh, Suburbans. I don't know how that worked. We had a couple loners that we went in new Suburbans. But Ralph, I, I think he'd, he'd said he'd not been out of the state of New Mexico. And he felt like it was his fault. We broke down. <laughs> I said, come on, Ralph. It's just a little breakdown. I do this all the time. It's no big deal. Amen. Aren't you glad we've got a Passover lamb today to celebrate? This song talks about him being the lion and lamb. Love the words. You know it. Sing it with me. It goes like this. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a liar, liar, Judah, is roaring with power, fighting battles. Every knee will bow before you. Our God is the lamb, lamb that was slain, sin of the world, his blood breaks the chains, every knee we bow before the lion and the lamb, oh every knee we bow before the lion and the lamb, so open up the gates, we before the key. Our God who calls us saved is here to set the captives free. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, lion of Judah, roaring with power, fighting a battle. Bow before you. Our God is 
is a lamb, lamb that was slain, sin of the world, his blood breaks and chains, every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb, oh every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Who can stop the Lord, oh my? Stop the Lord Almighty. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the lion, lion of Judah, roaring with power, fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before you. God is the Lamb, Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks and chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Can we just sing that bridge again? Who can stop the Lord? It goes like this. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion, lion of Judah, roaring with power, fighting. Every knee will bow before you. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks and chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion. Lord, we thank you this morning, celebrating a, a Palm Sunday today, thinking of the journey that you made to the cross. Lord, thank you for the example that you set for us. Lord, as you got to the Garden of Gethsemane, you said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. God, help us to learn those words today. Help us to follow in that path. Thank you today for your love that you poured out for us, for your grace. We celebrate it today. Just open our hearts again this morning, Lord, to receive your word as we, as we gather here this morning. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just one last song. Have, I, I don't remember ever singing this song here. But it's one I grew up singing, and it's in your book. I think it's page 164 if you want to hold it in the book. Marvelous Grace. Have we been talking about that? Book of Romans? Can't miss it, right? Marvelous grace. Can't even begin to wrap our minds around it, but we're going to try a little more today. Amen. Marvelous grace, oh, I love you, Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mouth I'll pour There where the blood of the Lamb was spilled Oh, grace, grace God's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse Within praise, grace, oh God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we can. 
cannot hide what can avail to wash it away look there is flowing a crimson tide whiter than snow you may be today sing grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace oh god's grace grace that is greater than Out of Luke, let me pull it up here real quick and I'll give you the exact reference. Luke chapter 19. We went through this not long ago in our Wednesday night Bible study. Those of you who have been part of that, you've had the notes sent out. Beginning in verse 28, I want to preface that by saying what happened prior to that. Prior to that was a confrontation with the Jewish religious leaders. And Prior to that was Jesus looking out across the valley to the city of Jerusalem and lamenting the fact that they had rejected God by rejecting his Messiah. So Jesus on this Palm Sunday, those many, many years ago, entered into the city of Jerusalem through the victory gates. He entered in on and we looked at this in our study so I don't want to get into too much depth there riding as we see the other accounts there was the mother donkey and the baby I believe Jesus alternated he entered in on the baby as an act of submission that God is not too above this when he switched to the mama he was still entering in on a donkey, a uh, beast of burden, but yet grown. Just simply bridging this gap between the beginning of their uh, Abrahamic co covenant all the way up into the maturity of it. So basically what is happening here is by the very riding of those animals, the mother and the baby, he is expressing the history of the Jews 
that they started out as the innocent baby. They ended up growing up into basically stubbornness and disobedience and all of those things. And yet he used that symbol as the entry point of his triumph. Normally, if you were conquering an army and bringing in the triumphal entry after the defeat, you would ride, he would have been on a great white stallion. Here's what is interesting. The triumphal entry is already announcing that Jesus has won. He has already triumphed. Even though he hasn't gone to the cross, he's going to the cross he hasn't come out of the grave, but he's going to come out of the grave. He's already prophesying ahead of time the outcome of everything that's going to happen that week. It's going to be the demise of the Jews, the, cer the ceremonial law, ultimately the destruction of the city, the temple, and the whole system in 70 A.D., never to be revived again, although that's very popular in dispensational theology today. And Jesus is simply saying, I have already won. Now, who began to worship him? Recall the story, and then we'll move to our outline. The children. They start crying out, Hosanna, son of David. What do the Pharisees and the religious rulers do? Now, remember, they're in charge, and they're used to being in charge. And all of a sudden, they're not in charge anymore. And they try to silence the kids. What does Jesus say? Even the rocks will cry out. God must be worshipped. He will be worshipped. In all that Jesus did on that Palm Sunday, he was foretelling the eternal outcome of victory. So victory is a complete act. In other words, the war is finished, but the individual battles take place in our day-to-day -day life for every generation. So the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, is Jesus declaring victory even before the deed of the cross and the outcome of the resurrection. <clears throat> now, having said all of that, we're going to take Romans chapter 6, beginning at 15 through the end, which is 23, and I think it overlays very nicely as we would ex expect it to do. And, and look at, this is the second half of last week that basically we used to be slaves to sin and it had conquered us and until we came to Christ there was no way out. He's already laid out in the previous six chapters the problem with all people is we are all sinners, we all stand guilty, we all stand condemned and that should be the outcome. And yet God preemptively creates the solution to our problem. And he begins to talk about being justified and being made righteous. And we need to know those two things before we really look at today or else I don't think we get the full impact and implication of what he's already said. If you have come to Christ, you are already completely saved. And yet, you are being saved today and yet, you will continue to be saved in the future. Okay, here's why that's important. If we see it as the whole is not one, then this world is going to keep beating us down and saying, God can't possibly love you. Look where you are. Look at your failures. Look at the guilt and shame we carry. And if we don't understand that Jesus through, through the cross and the empty tomb has already fully triumphed, he has had a triumphal entry into my life when I heard the gospel and accepted it. And it's done. It's finished. Sin has been conquered in my life, and yet I'm a sinner. Huh. That's a head scratcher, isn't it? I've already been declared righteous and holy, and yet I live in the day-to-day -day world, and I scratch my head again. I've already been translated. The word for that is raptured. shows up twice in Scripture and has nothing to do with what's being taught out there today. I've been raptured from darkness to light, translated. I've been raptured from death into life. I have been raptured from God's enemy 
to his loved child. Simply says it this way. We, he has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the glorious kingdom of his light. That's the rapture. It's being born again. Now, if you want to have the other discussion and all the other books that you read, I will gladly do that. been doing it for 34, almost 40 years now. It took me a while to get there. I think we can find so many answers as we go book by book. We put the pieces together of what God is doing. So he's already uh, declared that, that we are victors. Today he's going to talk about our enslavement. Okay, so that's where we have to, to start. When we were born into this world, we were born as slaves. Does the world ever talk about that kind of slavery? course not it doesn't understand it because it has to do with spiritual things and this world doesn't understand spiritual things <clears throat> so let's read through this and then we're going to break it down and my my hope and my point today is that we are either this or we are that in reality in fact how we live out each day is a process okay now I've got to pull up one more thing here. I've got it on my, give me a second here. Go back to the beginning. One of you read the, the first verse and chapter 6, and that will give me the answer I'm going to look for real quick. Romans 6, verse 1. Okay, so Paul sets out this hypothetical, and he asks a very pointed question. Question, Gary, one more time, please. Okay, that's the question. If you scroll up or turn your page or however it is in your Bible, verse 1 is the first big question. Now we start with the second big question, 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Okay, let me put the two together. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? And he then explains the answers to those questions. Last week we looked at the first question and the answer. Today we look at the second question and answer. And so what he says is, what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? First off, you have to understand what he just said. We're not under the law. And yet, most believers insist, insist on being under the law. We got to do this. We got to keep that. We got to, okay. Now, the law he's talking about is we looked at last week. And let me be careful that we don't misunderstand that. The ceremonial religious law is no more. The moral law of God has never been questioned. It has always been intact from the beginning, Adam and Eve, all the way through the rest of eternity. So when we say we're not under the law, it's not moral law that he's talking about. That's why he says, what then shall we sin? He's talking about the moral side of stuff. Because we're not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. Don't confuse religion, ceremonial law with moral law that has been integrated into us by the Holy Spirit who has made us born again. And now we understand who he is, what he's talking about. That's the whole Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said by those, but I say the moral codes never changed. So the moral law is a built-in feature of a holy God that requires the same of us, but we see that we have a problem. We can't keep it, the moral law. We don't have to keep the ceremonial law. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Got to deal with the word here. Servant is the word doulos, which is yesu das, our friend in India, and it means Jesus' slave. 
This is the word for enslavement. This is not, let me be as clear as I know how. Under Christ, it is not voluntary enslavement. It is mandatory enslavement. In the world, it dictates and mandates that you are a slave to sin. You don't get a choice. You were born that way. We are all born slaves, servants to sin, bond slaves. We, we're not free people. Now, we would like to say, as we put verses together, say, well, wait a second. In Christ, we're made free. Yeah, we're be, we are made free to become a slave to God and righteousness. Did you catch this? I hope I'm getting this across. You were born a slave, and you will die a slave. Who's your master? That's what he's asking. Sin your master? Or is righteousness your master? That's why it's entitled Slaves to Righteousness. This is not optional. This is not pull up at the window and I want this and hold the onions and hold the mayo and I want this and, you know, it's not that at all. That's what we keep trying to make it. We keep trying to make our walk a walk of options. And God says, wait a second. You have been bought with a price and you are not your own. I own you. Now, here's the difference. The world owns me to kill and destroy me and hurt me. God owns me to love me and save me. Whose slave are you? Now, he's going to get down. As we get down, we're going to see that the fact is this. As a believer who has been born again, I am a slave to righteousness. It just doesn't seem that way, appear that way, act that way at any given point in my life. But it's stated as a fact, a fact of position and ownership and, and, and entitlement. Jesus is entitled to me because he bought me with a price. Okay? Let me go on. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Were is important. It's past tense for all believers. You were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. In other words, the gospel. You heard it, you received it, you obeyed. Repent and believe. Trust the Lord. Lean not to your own understanding. All the different pieces we could, we could put in at that point. So here's the statement of fact in verse 18. <clears throat> it's highlighted because that's going to be your number two in the outline when I get there. Being made free from sin, you became the servants, slaves of righteousness. That's a fact. That's a position and a reality. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Yeah, we're sick with sin. We're sin sick, plain and simple. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and into, into iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. That's the process called sanctification, discipleship, becoming more like Christ. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness because it wasn't even on your radar, it wasn't a part, it didn't exist. You were guilty and didn't even know it. What fruit you had then in those things whereof you are now ashamed, we know what the fruit is. It's called the deeds of the flesh over in Galatians. For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, let's take some notes finally. First statement, we are all slaves Everybody, nobody's exempt. You can argue it all you want. We are all slaves. And we are slaves to one of two things, correct? Yep. Uh, nope, you're all 
Pinocchio, you're all liars. No. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. We are all slaves. That's a fact. Let it sink in. Today, I am enslaved. Well, I thought I was a free American. Well, Santa Fe is trying to fix that one. We're still fighting that battle, okay? We are a slave to sin, sold out, bond slave, legal documentation. Sin owns you. Or a slave to righteousness. Also, legally documented by the death of Christ and our acceptance upon hearing the gospel. So, if that is true, if we are all slaves and we are either a slave to sin and either a slave to righteousness as a reality, not as a point-by-point -point event, okay, don't confuse that, first bullet, shall we sin then because we're under grace? Hey, if, if I'm saved by God's grace, then, then it really doesn't matter what I do because the price is already paid, right? Well, that is a correct statement, but it's not the right kind of thinking and outcome. In fact, the outcome is God forbid. That's what he says in verse 15. God forbid. He's stating questions as a major doctrine. And the answer is God forbid. Don't, don't think that. Don't do that. Don't understand it that way. And then he explains it. Shall we sin because we are under grace? God forbid. If I sin while under that grace, am I forgiven? Yes. I have been forgiven from my past, from my present, from my future sin, all the way on into the end of my life unto eternal glory. That does not change. What changes is if I answer that question, shall we sin because we are under grace, and let me be uh, as blunt as I know how, then you're just a bratty kid disobedient no not heathen just fellow brats heathen or lost people brats act like heathens okay <laughs> but they are not we get whiny we get demanding we want God's blessing on everything we want him to solve all the problems we created and never pay any consequences. And he says, you know, pretty much jump off the roof, gravity kicks in. There you go. Sin is sin, and the wages of sin is death. Is it eternal death? Yeah, for the unbeliever, ultimately. For the believer, there are consequences and things along the, the line, and even those can fall under the grace and mercy of God to either minimize or maximize the outcomes. God sees the heart, and he knows if you need a little beating or a big whooping, and he will apply it accordingly because he loves us and he disciplines us. Which parent who does not discipline their child truly loves their kid? And the answer biblically is you don't. So when God is disciplining me or you or us or groups or whatever, it's out of love for the point of correction. It is not judgment. It is discipline. It's guidance. Okay? So the second part is we were slaves to sin until we obeyed the gospel and became freed from the slavery of sin. That happens when you're born again. But the working out of that reality is for the rest of your life, and therein lies the struggle with sin for the believer. The struggle of sin for the believer has to do with obedience, disobedience, holiness, unrighteousness. It has nothing to do with being saved or lost. You're already saved. Are you being obedient child or disobedient child? Are you being a surrendering child or a feisty, I'm going to fight back every single thing you say to you? We all know that if you've raised children or had teenagers or sometimes within spouses, right? <laughs> and I'm learning that the journey goes on with grandkids too. Our second one is, oh, man, he's like me at that age. I'm going, no wonder we're all slapping. 
Oh, and then hug him, of course. But slap first, then hug. And I just have to, I just have to realize from early, early, I mean, from as early as I can remember, that was his personality. And then ultimately, God, I believe, will use that in the future if he comes to the gospel message and comes to Christ. God will use that kind of personality in a very unique way. Whereas the, the oldest one is, is very compassionate, very loving, always concerned about other people. Number two is the heck with everybody else. It's all me for me. And you fit into some of those categories, I'm sure. So, we were slaves to sin until we obeyed the gospel, became freed from the slavery of sin, verse 17. Now, I added that in, in italics. Uh, I went ahead and left it on your sheet, I believe. We are accepted in the beloved because of the cross. And because we are accepted, we are justified. So, you might even underline accepted and justified. Then the next step in the process is self-surrender. Self-surrender is what brings us freedom to be free. And I base that ability to self-surrender because I have been justified. It's a circular thought. Christ has made me free. I've got to figure out what that means. And when I figure out that to be free in Christ is to obey him rather than sin, to be enslaved to him rather than this world, then all of a sudden I realize that, wow, Father really does know best. Hmm, the old sitcom, right? Our Heavenly Father does know best. And if we do stuff the way he tells us, we will be free, free from guilt, free from shame, free from all kinds of consequences, free from all sorts of stuff. And if we don't, then we have to, again, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not thrown out of the family. We're not unsaved, unloved, unjustified, unrighteous, all of that. We're not. It's just a matter of I have to realize every single day I am a slave. And today and right now, what am I? In practice, I'm talking about. Okay, not in reality, I'm already a slave to Jesus. I'm not a slave to this world anymore, in reality. But each day, I have to make the choice, am I a slave to me in this world or to Christ and his righteousness? On the days that I choose him, I wish I could tell you it was every day all the time. It just isn't. I know I'm free, I feel free, I'm spiritually productive, I am humbled and put before God in my proper place. When I'm on the other path, man, you talk about Captain Destructo. We can all go there, right? So I have to recognize every single day I, I will be owned by whatever I serve. And if I serve sin, it owns me that day, not eternally, but here and now. And if I serve Jesus today, then he owns me. And I know the difference. I can feel the difference. I experience the difference. So if you are not having that kind of battle, then I'd love more of what you have. And I think I am getting more of that as we go on. Number two. We were, again, I would circle that, underline it, that's the key thing, it's past tense. We were slaves to sin without Christ because we had not heard the gospel, we had not been confronted by it, we had not relinquished ourselves to the cross and been born again. We then were slaves to sin without Christ. Now, positionally, as a practicality, in reality, now we are made slaves to righteousness also in Christ. One is without him, one is, if, is with him. And that's what I just described. I used to be, but I'm not. And yet I still have that struggle within. We're going to get to that. We're getting there next chapter. And it's... Uh, it's one of the most perplexing chapters in Scripture. And it's in Romans. So we're going to have some of the hardest, 
biblical questions that have been asked for 2,000 years. All of them are in the book of Romans. So, gee, why didn't we do this a few decades ago? Well, because I just, sorry. That's all I can say. Wasn't there yet. I think we're there. So what do we say? First bullet. We are to yield. Okay, one thing I know about Farmington drivers, they have no clue what that upside-down triangle sign means. They can read the word. They just don't know what it means. That's how we translate it and apply it in the four corners. Yield means cut off, speed up, pull in front of somebody. Is that what it really means? No, of course not. Give the right away to somebody else because they are the main concern. You're the auxiliary merging in. And we also don't know merge at all. We don't get merge at all. Either slam on the brakes and stack everybody up or hit the pedal and cut somebody off. Uh, that's not merging, okay? Say again. Did you hear that? Any, any siren, any siren, law, pull off. Stop. Yeah. We did a funeral procession out to Sanosti with people weaving in and out, cutting off, not respect. And we were going highway speeds because it just isn't taught and people don't care. And if you want to prove it, go walk through the mall and just set your course and walk and see how many people will run into you because you're busy doing something else and it's not you. I have experimented with standing against the wall and tucking my feet in as far as I could and I still got tripped on. I'm going, how can you walk on the wall, people? For crying out loud, get out, you know, I don't get it. That's the sin nature. It's my world, my bubble, what I'm doing, no concern, no respect, no regard for anybody else. That's what sinners do to God and do to each other and do to self. We just set our own agenda and we, we, we fly with it. And we're not aware that we're tripping people up and causing accidents and doing all sorts of stuff because I'm good, so it's their problem, right? So to yield ourselves in our entirety, now what does entirety mean in that statement? Spiritually, in my thinking, in my feelings, and physically. It covers everything that's fallen. I have to learn to yield stuff that I don't like to yield to because another word comes into play. I may have the right of way, but I choose to forbear exercising that so that we don't have a wreck. Because if I do not yield to the one that should be yielding, I'm not going to get in a wreck just to prove a point. Okay, It's not worth it. But if we take that as an analogy spiritually, we tend to do that. We tend to do those very things. We, uh, in our in our aggressive aggressive type A's, or in your passive aggressive type B, we are still all aggressive. That's the common word, and we will do it either politely aggressively or actively aggressively. But the whole point is to be aggressive, and basically come out on top, and prove a point. And so we tend to do that as believers against God because. Somehow he's busy doing something else and he doesn't really understand all the details of what's in my life and he really doesn't understand what I'm going through and, you know, I've had all this trauma and all. And he's a very patient father saying, ah, oh, I wish my two-year-old kids would grow up a little bit. And they eventually do. That's the good news. We all, we all will grow up. We all will make it. That's the good news. We are to yield ourselves in its entirety to righteousness in the same way, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, ultimately physically. We tend to see the things, which part do we see the most publicly? The physical part, right? But there are good compliant people that seem to be obedient, that inside they are raging, lo raving lunatics. And, and they are wreaking all kinds of havoc upon the world just by their attitude, but you'd never know it because they say please and thank you, and they okay. do 
some study on serial killers and you'll get the point. They're always the good, nice neighbor. Before Christ, we need to yield ourselves in the same way we used to yield ourselves to unrighteousness. We served. So we have to learn the flip-flop. Okay? Second bullet under two. When we don't yield, when we continue even as God's kids, or while we were yet not God's kids, the outcome of sin is spoiled fruit. Either in the life of the unbeliever, spoiled fruit. Name some of the spoiled fruit. Pride, power, control, anger, murder, all kinds of list, right, stuff. Uh, the thing is, God's children can still do those same things. Hopefully it's not quite to the same degree. But uh, the fact is this. The, the only difference is my spoiled fruit under Christ is now returned. It's called hay and stubble. It's worthless. To me, I thought it was good and the right thing to do, and I did whatever. And in the end, it counted for nothing. It was hay and stubble. It, it, the only thing to do is throw it in the fire, it burns up, and it's gone. But it's spoiled fruit. That's what's happening. The outcome then of righteousness is godly fruit. And here's what I believe about that. In the big picture and in the long run, do not look at your own fruit so closely that you get stuck on the spoiled or you get stuck on one or the other. And don't do it to other people. Back off and determine through the heart that person belongs to Jesus or not. Anybody not know God's children are capable of all kinds of horrendous stuff? If you don't know, you're not really in the battle. Equally, what the world will dish out. That's the surprise of it. In fact, that's the shock of it because we assume that when we come to Christ, all of that goes away and disappears. So that's, Kelly, where I was messing with you this morning. Are you angry because of righteous anger? Or is Kelly just ticked off right now? And the answer was, Kelly's just ticked off right now. I said, yeah, me too. <laughs> if we can discern that, first off, we are free to have the outlet to get that out. We just want to be careful how we do it. It doesn't change God. It doesn't offend him. But we also don't want to live there and stay there. And so we ultimately want, uh, how can I tell good fruit? It's lasting. It's nutritious. Smells good. Looks good. Tastes good. All of that. But you know what? That's kind of what it looked like to Eve in the garden. The wrong fruit. So we've got to be careful how we weigh these things out. But here's what I do know. The outcome of sin is spoiled fruit. It's bad stuff. It's rot. It's decay. It's worthless stuff. It's no good for anything. And the outcome of righteousness is godly fruit, and it does not count to my account at all. It goes into the count of Jesus, my Lord, and he gets the credit for it, and I don't. That's godly fruit. Now we're to the third part, the hardest, and actually the this is the thing that I think, it, to me, is most important. First off, we have been, past tense, we have been freed from the eternal wages of sin because we have come to the cross and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness, forgives everything. It's a done deal. Jesus, as he triumphantly came into Jerusalem, was already pointing forward to our victory. Not little victories, not the way victory is being displayed in so many of our songs and Christian radio and all that. The, the, those are little things that, that we want to be in charge of so we can mark it, you know, one for God, one for the world, one for God. One. No. Victory is eternal. And in the losses of this world, 
don't think that the eternal has been lost because it hasn't. The victory is already there. I do not have to prove it. I do not make it happen. It is there. So that's what this is talking about. We have been freed from the eternal wages of sin. Now, it's important to put the internal in there because our first bullet lays this out. This world and the world to come. Every single person in this room, we all will pay the temporal wages of sin. We will die. And Paul goes on over in Corinthians and he lays out, and it's a wonderful chapter on the resurrection, and he says, this corruption must put on incorruption. And so I will die in my corruptible body, but I will be raised in my incorruptible body. I died because of sin, of humanity, but I was raised in the likeness of Christ, the resurrection. So we all still pay the temporal wages of sin. This body will die in its corruption. And again, we all know this, you've heard me say this before, when we lose loved ones, which we have had significant amounts in this family here, the very first question that is typically asked is, how did they die, right? What did they die of? I think a correct answer is death. Because death assumes that this body is failing at every point. Now, my assumption medically, according to my medical charts, I will die of one of two things, Beck, total anxiety or heart. Or the anxiety will lead to the heart death. <laughs> or, or the heart disease will lead to the anxiety death. Now, the fact is, I don't know that. Because typically when people do pass, it's of multiple things. Systems are breaking down. It's kind of which part broke down first and to the greatest degree. But the wages of sin is death, so we shouldn't be surprised. What we would all like is as peaceful of a death as we could, if we could special order it. I've been special ordering it for years. Can I please just lay down someday and not get up? But I don't get that choice. God already knows what's going to happen, and I have to just embrace that and be thankful for that. That when my day comes, it doesn't matter because I will die in corruption, be raised in incorruption. I will die a sinner and be raised with no sin forevermore. That's pretty good. That's, that's kind of like resurrection Easter news for next week, right? The last two pieces talk about the other part of the wages of sin. Jesus paid the wages of sin on the cross of Calvary. Therefore, I will not ever be eternally separated from I have already stood before him, and there is no condemnation in Christ. So if you are still a believer who thinks you will stand before God and give an account of all of your, your sin, because that's what you have read that the Bible says, then, then you've added, uh, you've inserted a phrase. There is no sin to be judged by. It's already been judged. Christ carried it all then what will we be judged for? Stewardship, obedience, being a faithful servant. And at that point, some will shine. Some will still be like a one candle power, and others will be 10,000 candle power. And some will offer to Jesus all the hay and stubble, and it uh, doesn't count. That's the end of it. No more discussion. Because Jesus has already paid my debt. There's nothing that can be added to make me more saved, more loved, more forgiven. I can't be punished again because double indemnity, right? 
Jesus already died for my sins. I can't, I can't be paid back for what's already been paid for. It's, it's a done deal. Do you understand that as a believer, that your sins through the blood of Calvary and the power of the resurrection are completely washed away, are completely forgiven, they will never stand before you to accuse and condemn you ever again. The issue is Jesus, yes, Jesus, no. Jesus, yes, enter into the place prepared for you. So the third bullet is very true. All of our sin has been judged. Our judgment has to do with faithful stewardship, and it will either be to God's glory or our embarrassment. I won't. God will not rake up all of my past and throw it in my face and rub it in my face. There's nothing that exists of that. Our sins have been blotted out. Now, I have on the, did I print out that last part? That is a hymn that keep, back we both had hymns from old days that keep popping up in our head. This is one of them that has, keeps popping into my head over the last several months. It's on Christ the solid rock I stand, I think. You can find it in your hymnal real quick there. I don't know what number it is. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. This is a wonderful doctrinal hymn. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. And then the refrain. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. And the refrain. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. No judgment, no condemnation. Folks, this is where we're all going. Okay? This is the outcome. I cannot tell you, and I, in fact, I won't tell you, I won't tell you my own struggles. Suffice it to say it's enough to destroy me and everybody around me at any given time. And yet God in his mercy says, I haven't left you. I haven't forsaken you. Um, sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't, right? And God says, but I am steady. Don't you worry about your steadiness. Just trust in my steadiness. Do not, do not put your hope in your own thoughts and your own ways. Rather, in all your ways, trust him. Why? Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. My salvation, no matter how I explain my salvation and your salvation, it doesn't even scratch how big and huge and complete and eternal it is. We simply can't grasp how much Jesus loves us. We cannot grasp, although we try on the stage to portray his death and suffering. We're, 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 that's all it is, is a shadow mimicking. And from time to time, when I'm in my right senses, I have to think of what Jesus had to do for this rascal. And I don't understand it, quite frankly. And he says, but that's what I did for you. And I care, and I love you, and I've forgiven you, and what are you not understanding? How about one more hug? Yeah, I need that says, wait until you get home. 
Hugs all over the place for everybody. Group hugs. We had a little group hug this morning. Jesus already triumphed on Palm Sunday because nobody could undo the purposes of the cross and resurrection. Nobody could undo the wisdom of God's plan to become the sinner that we might live. Nobody saw that coming. And we need to keep revisiting it over and over again. Next week, Resurrection Sunday, we're going to start into one of the most perplexing chapters in the entire Bible. And yet, the empty tomb is the victory. And if we can, if we can stay there, then, then it'll make sense. Otherwise, it's just one more Easter and, you know, let's go hunt some eggs. Hopefully we get way beyond that, right? Let's pray. Father, help us to know that through Christ on the cross of Calvary, through your beating and blood on that cross, we were paid for. We were bought and paid for. And if we then accept that gospel message, we become your child through the new birth, born not of the will of man, but strictly through the Spirit. Father, help us keep studying through this very important book in Scripture. Long overdue for, for many, for most. And help us to keep pulling out of it the truth of who we are in Christ. Help us to further understand Though we may have good, loving people in our, in our uh, circles, it may be family, friends, fellow workers, if they don't know Christ, the outcome for them is horrendous and unchangeable. And so why would we not want to share what we have found in Christ? Not in a religious, dogmatic, picking a fight with people way. We can go there pretty quick. But how about, Lord, if we surrender to you to be your mouth and your hands and your feet to do the things we need to do. You'll do the work. You've already done the work. Our job is to serve you. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing one more with us, guys, before we go. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is he. Sing a new song, hymns and song, heaven's mercy see.
His wonder. 